So, I mean, I think it's important to, you know, the question about, you know, sort of my view on black, black youth is to start with kind of a historical perspective, and that is to really understand, you know, how is it that young people, black youth, um, have always sort of come together to speak out against the injustices, uh, injustices in society. And I think there are really, you know, three waves of movements that are relevant to kind of the backdrop of understanding how young people respond. I mean, the first, I was just talking uh, uh, to Bob Joe Cooks about, um, the first is around really the civil rights movement, right? Um, and actually even prior to the civil rights movement, and even in the, the late 40s and early 1950s, we saw young people really um, introducing a profound innovation into what had become a rather stagnant civil rights movement and young people um, introducing the sit-in and introducing nonviolence, uh, which actually incurred violence, right? So using violence as a strategy to move forward a civil rights agenda. This was not possible um, without the voices of young people at that time. Young people always can risk things that adults cannot or will not do. And so you have no social movements without young people. They do not exist from the establishment of adults. They always come from young people, whether it be in Tian in China, whether it be in Cuba, where it be in the United States, where it be in Mexico. Young people are always at the vanguard of social movements and, and justice. The second wave, I think, um, of movement activity, um, you know, 
we saw in the 19, early 1970s um, and even, even into some of the 80s where we saw urban riots or urban rebellions, I should say, right? Where young people um, had um, witnessed profound um, amounts of police violence. We saw it with Rodney King. We saw that in the, the first uh, um, Watts Rebellion where young people um, uh, are responding in ways that people say they are riots, right? Um, and I don't recall what happened in Watts or in South Central LA riots um, as much as I call them rebellions because when you study social movements, young uh, people use what means they have available to, ex to express their voice. And when there is no access to the franchise of voting, young people use whatever they have. And so they used turn over cars, they did whatever they needed to do to bring attention to the conditions that were in South Central LA. The third movement, or the third wave of activism I think we're experiencing now, right, which is um, the movements for black lives. Uh, not necessarily Black Lives Matter, which is a particular aspect of the broader movement, but the entire movement for black lives is a different movement, and it's largely different because it's calling for the centrality of black dignity. And the Black Lives Matter aspect of that certainly is possible, um, of, uh, was sparked by, not by Ferguson. Let me, let me say that a lot of people say the Black Lives Matter movement was sparked by Ferguson. But I want everyone in this room to recall how you felt, not what you said, not what you, what, what you, what you thought about, but when you saw black people in um, Louisiana, the Hurricane Katrina, the Hurricane Katrina, y'all remember that? You were in high school or elementary school or whatever. How did you feel when that happened? Well, if you were like me, you felt a sense of rage and betrayal, right? A sense of rage and betrayal that First, the federal government and the news were calling them refugees, knowing that refugees somehow de delegitimized their citizenship in America. If you, if you saw, like me, black people asking for water on their roofs, knowing that the federal government could have went in there and addressed those needs of black families far before they did, right? And so Katrina was really the genesis of the movement for black dignity that we see now. Not necessarily Ferguson. It, it came to a head in Ferguson, but it was a it was a series of things that occurred that that sort of fostered the movements of, for Black dignity today. So, um, so Jason's question about you know how how is it that I see Black activism, Black youth activism, um, the way that I see it, and history uh, uh, also testifies to this notion that we don't have social movements. You don't have any profound social without the centrality and the, 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 um, the, the involvement of black young people in social change. We just don't have it, right? So I hear you saying two things. I hear you saying that black youth, in terms of their engagement, has been important in terms of social change um, for black people, but also for the, like, the, the changes we have seen in this country. Um, but I also hear you saying that uh, the citizenship or the status Black youth have been somewhat negated. Um, how does that play, and how does how does that come up, or how does that begin to inform the experience of Black youth? Well, I mean, you know, um, I've written about what I call sort of the Jim Crow status of Black youth, right? and that is, um, in many ways, Black young people in urban America um, are forced to navigate harsh laws or policies in their schools, zero tolerance policies. They're forced to navigate um, police harassment. They're forced to navigate even um, dangerous um, exposure of violence in the neighborhood, right? And so, um, so, so all of these, all of these um, um, exposures to policies and, and, and practices in neighborhoods make it much more difficult for young people to um, to respond to. So, you know, actually, I think I forgot your question. Well, I just wanted to look at like how. So yeah, I'm sort of giving you an example of what I call sort of Jim Crow status, which is they're influenced by these practices, but do not have the power or the or the legitimate power to change.
change the policies and practices in their schools and neighborhoods, right? And so what we saw in Katrina was a narrative being introduced, right? Not necessarily a policy, but policy first happens with a narrative change. And you don't have a policy that's not consistent with the fundamental belief of a society. And so when it's, what we saw in Katrina was a language and a narrative being created about undeservingness of them folks. So black folks that were in Katrina were undeserving of federal support. They were undeserving, right? You can remember. And so when you use the term refugee, it denoted a sense of otherness, which means they're not deserving of the kind of response they should have gotten, right? So all of these things connote a Jim Crow status, meaning second class citizenship. What we see in this current movement is black young people rejecting that, um, placing the centrality of black lives at the center of political debate in America. That, and it really hasn't, I mean, not since the black power movement has that happened. And so what that means is when you say black lives, it is a claiming of the centrality of the humanness of black folks in this country about how we are supporting policies that raise, support, advance the dignity of black families and communities. Yeah, so I'm gonna challenge you a little bit because I, I, I think I agree with part of what you're saying, but I think um, I don't want us to have this conversation where there's this monolithical experience for black youth, right? So I hear you're talking about black youth um, like centralizing this idea of being dignified, right? Um, and they're responding to this Jim Crow status. But what about the brother or sister that's growing up in the Acorn Project um, that might not have all the resources and maybe, you know, they're in survival mode? Like, what is their response to the Jim Crow status? Like, even though they might not know the language, they know something's wrong, right? But is their response still about dignity? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, in response, my quick response to your, your, your question is, um, any oppressed people will find a way to have a voice, right? And my example of that in relationship to black youth is hip hop, right? We, we won't have, we wouldn't have hip hop, right? Uh, as a art form, but also a, a critical social critique had it not been for gross disinvestments in the Bronx, right? Um, we would not have hip hop had there been a flourishing of arts programs in, in, in New York. We wouldn't have had hip hop had there been jobs available, right? So hip hop emerged out of a critical economic social misery, right? That blocked young black young people's voice about their experience. What we see, and this is why hip hop started as a, you know, um, it started as a social, social critique, but it also kind of morphed early in the early 70s and 80s to like braggadociousness, I am this, I am that, right? And that's largely a form of dignity statement, right? Here's who I am. Here's who I, who's, here's where I come from, right? That's a way in which black young people in early hip hop were claiming a sense of dignity by claiming place and personhood. Um, and both of which were a response to the social toxicity of, 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 of how people were thinking about uh, black lives and the Bronx at that time. Yeah, good. And I think I think that I think that's real. I think what you're saying is that um, that response to dignity can show up in different ways. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important because I think that sometimes when we hear words, we also project them to mean one thing and one thing solely. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but could you expound more on the social toxicity? Because I think that's a term that mm -hmm. folks might hear but not truly understand what you mean by right. that. Right. So I use the term. Um, you know, the question is. Um, in my last book, I, was, I introduced a concept called radical healing, which is a way in which young people need to heal from the exposures to all kinds of issues in their society. So, you know, you know we're 40, 50 years out of the civil rights movement. And we can't assume that society's barriers and society's challenges have remained constant. We've experienced is really a, ma a maturation, a maturing of racism. Racism ain't the same. What we've, what we've experienced is a maturation of racial segregation. It looks different, but it still has just as profound impact. And so, what we've seen in in Black America, in neighborhoods, communities, schools, and homes, is the ways in which.
the barriers of, of race, racial segregation and racism and institutionalized racism are not just limited to um, equal opportunities. So for example, it's no longer simply the fact that I can't get a job or it's not about that um, my schools are, are not of quality or I don't have access to health care. Those are structural issues. But those structural issues also erode hope. They erode the ability for young people to see beyond the current condition, right? Which for me is the most dangerous, the most insidious part of oppression. It's when you can't imagine another way. And so what radical healing suggests is that in order to transform systems and transform these systems, we have to heal from it. We have to heal from the things that harm us. And so I use the term social toxicity to give life to what I believe has, is that harm. So if you think about, if we were in a room, think about your house, your apartment that you live in, if it had lead paint in it, or asbestos in where you lived, eventually your exposure to that lead paint and asbestos would make you sick. And if you're not healed from that, lead, that exposure to that lead paint and asbestos, if you're not healed from it, it'll eventually kill you, right? It becomes lethal. Well, just like there are physical toxins, like lead paint and asbestos, there's social toxins. And social toxins are things like fear, anxiety, shame, right? I'm shameful. Like when I grew up, I was shameful for my wide nose and thick lips and kinky hair, right? Shame, embarrassment, uncertainty, fear, right? All of these things are just as lethal, but they're harder to detect because they're invisible. They're social, but they exist in our environments. They exist in schools. They exist in neighborhoods. Uh, but Teachers, social workers, youth development professionals are not trained to detect those kinds of social toxins, that is, forms of social toxins, to social toxins. And so the concept of radical healing says, first, teachers, social workers, youth development folks need to be able to detect social toxicity, right? And then once you can detect it, here's how you transform it. And so social toxin, social toxin is a way of thinking about how we are all exposed to toxicity and the ways that it erodes our, our capacity to be fully human. The thing about social toxicity is that it doesn't just affect young people. It affects me, it affects you, it affects everyone because it's, it's toxic, right? It doesn't just find itself in certain classrooms or certain neighborhoods. It affects everyone. Everybody in this room has been exposed to some form of social toxicity because you've experienced fear, you experience uncertainty, you've experienced some shame, You've experienced these things, right? The question is, is how you've been supported around that, right? And so, and so the radical healing process that I found most profound is when organizations and schools and courageous teachers are actually able to provide supports for young people of color, particularly black young people, to heal from those harms that, that they've experienced. And could you share with us what is some of that work that needs to be done? I mean, you're talking about how people being impacted spectrum of students. A lot of our faculty get a spectrum of students. But a lot of these students, according to what you're saying, are impacted by these social toxicities. Then if that's the case, how are we supposed to support our students? Mm -hmm. What can we do inside those classrooms to support? Because we're also asking them now, be present, learn, be right. mindful of what's going on around you, but we know that you're being harmed at the right. same time. Right. So, so I assume that um, first of all, Nobody is immune from exposure to social toxicity, no matter your age, your gender, your class, that everybody is exposed to it in some ways, which means it's in the classroom and it means it affects me. So for me, my first step to providing, to being able to support students is to support myself, right? Is to, to assure my own sense of well-being because my research suggests that I've been to schools, neighborhood organizations throughout the country, South Side Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, and people who work with young people say the same thing. Like, damn, man, I'm stressed out too. Man, I don't know if I can make it. I can't do this damn work for too much longer because, you know, I just lost a kid and I'm losing my own sense of mental health, right? So the first is, how are you supporting yourself, 
right? What practices do you engage in daily that supports your own sense of well-being? Because if you're not well, your young people ain't gonna be well. I can guarantee you that. So my research has found that people who have regular practices of their own sense of well-being, that psychological, spiritual, cognitive, and behavioral well-being, what are you doing in those dimensions to support yourself? I think everybody should be able to take inventory at the end of the week, right? What did I do for my own mental well-being, spiritual well-being, physical well-being, right? Behavioral well-being, what did I do that actually contributed? You should be able to go at the end of the week on, on, on Saturday night or Friday night, whatever your end of the week is, and go, well, you know what? I read a book that made me feel good. Um, I jogged, or I did yoga, that's physical well-being. I meditated. I just took a walk. Let me, y'all, I, I can tell you this, man. Just give me a second, right? So um, I, I think this is critically important because I have students that come to my class or come to my office hours um, pretty much once a week in tears, right? Like literally crying. Like I'm not a therapist. I'm not trained as a therapist. And they're coming to me because they can't do something with their young people, right? And, and they can't do something with their young people because their lives are in turmoil. They're homeless, they just got in a physical fight with their partner, they can't pay their rent, their lives are in turmoil. So they want to be, they want to show up good for young people when they're, there's all this other stuff happening. Right? Stressed out. I can't, and they, they use it begins like this. I can't turn into assignment the midterm on Wednesday because blah, 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 blah. So what I usually do is look, stop. Because if you don't take care of this, you're going to be in a mental hospital and you're not going to be good for nobody. My assignment to you is over the next seven days, find something you do that brings you a sense of joy. That's my assignment. Go do that. Write about it and come back and tell me about it. That's my assignment. The reason I do that is I need to disrupt the madness. I need to disrupt what's not healthy for people. Because we in the social justice sector kind of believe that taking that time is some extra shit. I'm sorry. It's some extra stuff. Right? It's extra stuff to do. It ain't the real work, right? It ain't the real work. It's taking care of myself as something else. No, taking care of yourself is the first thing you should do because if you don't do that, you're not going to be good for anybody else. So I give them an assignment and they come back and say, uh, just last week, I took a walk in the park and I was amazed. I saw birds, right? I, I took a, you know what I did? I, 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 took a, uh, I took a bike ride on the estuary. It was so good. I took my son with me. We just, we didn't do anything. We just bought ice cream. We did that for two hours. And then my next assignment is do that once a week. No matter what happens, do that once a week and see what happens, right? So taking care of yourself and trying to make inventory about what you're doing to sustain your well-being is the very first practice, right? There's a lot of other practices we can give um, our, our students and our young people, but we first have to figure out what, how are we supporting ourselves. So that's big, and so when I, I, I think it's important saying is that it's important for educators, mental health practitioners, folks that are working with young people or students to take care of themselves first. Yeah. That's the primary step. Yeah, and I say that, you know, I see, and I don't call it self-care, you know, kind of the, you know, Mill Valley kind of white folk, like self-care, like take care, not, not that kind of thing, right? When I'm talking about care, I'm saying, Taking care of yourself is the most important social justice act you can engage in, right? Your care is an act of justice because the things that are coming at us, right, are, unjust, are unjust. And so what happens is, is oppression tells us all we can do is fight against it. Fighting against it actually supports injustice if we're not taking care of ourselves. Y'all not even listening to me. Because when we're pushing up against stuff, right? When we fight, 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 resist, 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 that's necessary, but it's not sustainable because we don't have a language of care. We don't have a language of joy. We don't have a language of, of, of other things that sustain us as we fight against oppression, right? So we have to have both sides of the equation. So basically, it's important that, that we disrupt the system by engaging yes. in self-care. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. And so then, when it, taking it back to our young people that you know that I identified earlier when I read this article saying that we're in crisis, what's the connection between our youth being in crisis and maybe their understanding 
of self-care or joy or you yeah. know maybe maybe part of their resistance is to always fight but what you're saying is fighting is a part of the system that maintains their oppression absolutely and so then how do we how do we shift yeah. that for them well we have to we have to introduce um, and so so I push against you know black youth are in crisis we our society is in crisis and it's embedded in our in everybody right um, so 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 I reject that right but there are things that we can do so the first thing is that we have to begin to enter we have to first acknowledge and understand how oppression works against us right so even as we work to fight against it to disrupt it there's language that we use that's not healthy for the long-term um, the long-term fight against justice so for example if I, if I ask you to list what do social justice app organizers do, you would say they fight against oppression, they resist, they struggle, right? This is the terms that we use. Fight, resist, and struggle, that's necessary, but it ain't something we want to do our whole lives. Fight, resist, and struggle. I want to have some joy. I want to have some peace, right? I want to, I want to flourish, right? But those terms, if we don't even use those terms in our daily practices, how are we supposed to get, how are we supposed to get it? Is as if fight, struggle, and resistance is the means and the end. But it ain't. Fight, struggle, and resistance is the means to an end that we don't even, we can't even name now. Y'all follow me? So we have to understand what we want. We want joy. We want peace. Right? We want a sense of, we want harmony. When I talk to uh, people who work uh, in, in city departments, I was in New York two weeks ago working with the probation department and the, the uh, police department, and they have this huge violent, violence prevention strategy that they're working in neighborhoods. And I said to them, um, do you really want lower, do you just want lower levels of violence? Police officers were like, yes. I'm like, let me ask the residents. Let's ask the people who live in the housing projects. What do you want? They didn't say they want lower levels of violence. You know what they said? I want to be able to take my kid out in the park and play basketball with them. I want to be able, I want them to be able to ride. I want them to be able to stay in after the street lights come on. Y'all hear me? Yeah. In other words, I want a sense of peace. I want peace in my neighborhood, not just lower levels of violence. And so I told the police officers in the department that you have to invest in increasing peace, not only the reduction of violence. When you name what you want to see, then you have a greater chance of achieving it. If our, if our ultimate aim is just a reduction of violence, guess what we're going to get? We're going to get a lower level of misery. That y'all so, so, how do, so how do we get people to have that perception? Because what I hear you're saying is that with the probation officers, they were in this space where they were just like, if we reduce it, I'm fine with that. But the people that are impacted by yeah. it were in a very different place. And they were saying, hey, yeah. I want it to be like this. And they actually were able to identify what it felt like. How do we get folks to be able to have that type of vision? Because some folks, they're not they're not having that same understanding. Is it the language you brought up or we're talking about how people are kind of like we just fight? Or yeah. is it Yeah, I mean I think it's I think it's there's some specific things that I know that I've used to support young people, right? And it's it's um, there's they start small and I think they build. I want to start with a small story just about my son, right? I can tell a lot of different stories about my son. But I can call my son, I should put him on the speakerphone right now. And he's at, he's at UCLA. I can say, son, how you doing? Now, let me back up a little bit. Something good just happened to my son. He got, he's, a, he's in the film and all that, he studies film. He just got a great opportunity to do something in film. And I can call him right now and say, hey, son, how you doing? And he's going to say three, one of three things. Cool. Good, I'm all right. I'm cool, I'm good, I'm all right, right? And if I extrapolate from that for my son, that means if you talk, talk to most black men around their emotional literacy, it's reduced, I'm cool, I'm good, I'm all right, right? And, and what that does is that it restricts the range of things you can feel and name. We can't name, I'm excited, or I'm, I'm, I feel embarrassed, or I feel hurt, right? Uh, 
So with my son, right, I try to get him to expand his emotional literacy, right? From I'm good, I'm cool, I'm I right? So um, I, I might ask him to tell me about what happened. How do you feel about that? And really just try to, and he knows what I'm doing, so he, he pushes against it. But my point is, is if you can, if you're working with young people, and you might, you know, have the cool, I'm good, I'm I syndrome, then is it possible to introduce three or four more emotional terms in their vocabulary, right? So let's encourage young people to, to use I'm hurt, or I'm hopeful, or I'm excited, or basic, they're basic things, Jason, that, that once we, we begin to lay that foundation, after time, we begin to have a much more sophisticated and expansive emotional vocabulary. And once you have that, then you can begin to name the things you want to see in your life. But if you, if you only got five words to describe what you want, then you're, you're, you're reducing what's possible. But the more that we can expand that, the greater possibilities uh, arise. So that, that, that makes me think about uh, how we also see our youth, right? Um, and when, I, when, when I'm asked to do these lectures or these conversations with a mental health practitioner and educators, a lot of times um, how they see black youth is problematic. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I often offer that they should do an asset-based assessment. So they should be seeing them from a positive perspective first. How do we make sure something like that happens? What are the type of things that we can support? How are the type of things that we can do to support our, like our educators, our youth development, our social justice, seeing young people, particularly young black youth, from an asset point of view, not like you know they're in crisis yeah. or they're already at a deficit. Yeah. No, I mean it's a it's a good question, and you know how how teachers and youth workers show up in our programs and our schools is really a function of a broader issue, which is structural racism, which is white supremacy. And so, you know, if I had my you know, if I had my wherewithal, I would require any training, um, any teacher training program, or any youth development training program to include a process, cognitive and emotional process, for white folks to understand racism and white supremacy, emotionally and in their head, right? Usually what happens is that, you know, it's introduced cognitively, like here's this thing called racism, and it exists, and here's what it does, right, cognitively. But it never connects it to how they live their their, 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 it never connects to an emotional space. So for example, if I were to do, even this conversation, if there are people who identify with white in this room, just me talking about it, you might feel a certain way, right? When I introduce this to my class, the whites, they want to go intellectually, but they don't want to talk about, I feel uncomfortable talking about race. Why do you, let's go, let's go there, right? Why do you feel uncomfortable? I don't have the right language, I don't want to offend anybody, I don't want to be perceived as a mean, spirited person, evil person, so I just shut down. So if I had my wherewithal, I think it's important for folks who are, who are who identify as white to take seriously a process of undoing race in their, in their own lives, not just cognitively, but also social emotion. That means what you read, the language you use, and become much more versed in that process. So, I mean, so I, I, I hear that, and I think that that is a good step. But a lot of folks are on different pages with this racism thing, right? I mean, if we metaphorically, if we, if we, you know, put it in context, you know, there's people that haven't picked up the book. There's some people on page 16, mm -hmm. there's some people on 37, there's some people that's like, I'm not even buying the book, right? Yeah. So how do we deal with that when some people are like rejecting racism? Yeah. Even if we know that it's the fabric of what's going on. Because I still think no matter, my experience is, it doesn't matter if I'm in Miami or New York or wherever, the teachers want better outcomes, right? They want their young people to, to, to produce, they want their young people to do better, right? Um, so even if they have racial bias, right? Even if they have that, they still want better outcomes. And so, you know, my question is simple. This, you know, room full of teachers, my question is, is are you satisfied with the outcomes of, of what you've been doing? No. If you tried all this, you have to try all these other things. Okay, then. Then if you've tried all these other things and you're producing the same outcomes, maybe it's time to try something else. And by trying something else, you open up the possibility of 
producing those kind of outcomes. But you know, the, the same kind of strategies, you know, multicultural education, you know, those sorts of, you know, you may have tried those things, but you haven't produced those results because the root of the issue still remains. And so to get the kind of outcomes that you want to get, you have to have different kinds of inputs. And that different kind of input is dealing with and having some conversations about the ways in which race shows up individually and shows up in the system that, that teachers are a part of. So you brought up the, the, the idea of social toxicity and you said it could be anywhere. And so when I think about um, the classroom um, and social toxicity, how do we ensure that that, that classroom setting is a healing space? I know we don't, we, we ultimately sometimes don't think about classrooms being healing spaces. We think about churches or synagogues or, you know, or, uh, you know uh, the masjid or whatnot. Um, but how do we ensure that this learning space also is a space for healing? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, because our tendency is to think about classroom space as a learning space. Um, but you can't get to learning when people are wounded, right? Um, and so classroom space has to have certain dual purposes, right? So, um, so I think the first thing is uh, the space has to be safe, right? Physically and emotionally safe. How do you create safety? You create safety by people sharing their story, right? So, um, you know, we did, I did a training last month um, with these teacher artists in New York at Carnegie Hall, and they were trying to go into the, these, you know, mostly white teachers trying to go into the housing projects to teach kids art and all these other things. But the, the they didn't take time to create a safe space. And safe space is just, how are we building relationships within a space that allow people to share and go on that journey together, right? The second thing then is engaging people in emotional growth, social and emotional growth, right? The way that I do that is I oftentimes, so once we have relationships, and relationships is you change from seeing transactional relationships to transformative relationships. Transactional relationships are, I'm the teacher, you the student. I'm, you know, I'm the professor, you're the student, right? I'm the dean, you're whatever. Those are transactional relationships, and they're efficient, but they're not effective in building human spaces. So tra shifting to transformative relationships is I see you beyond the title. I can see you as a person. I know your story, share your story. And the second thing is, is providing em um, emotional growth opportunities. So I ask questions to my students before you engage in the lesson. So, and I can try this right here. So, a question that I ask for that engagement is, when was the last time you did something for the first time? When was the last time you did something for the very first time, right? And so it's a way that it gets people to reflect and think about their lives. And there's no right or wrong answer. But if you can't think of the last time you did something for the first time, maybe it's time to do something for the first time, right? Maybe your life is too safe. Maybe there's, maybe there, you're not taking enough risk, but it becomes a way in which you begin to think about your life in connection and relationship to others, right? So engaging in critical questions about people's lives, right? And then, and then the last piece then is um, creating um, takeaways and lessons, right? So, um, making sure that whatever curriculum that you have or the lessons that you're being taught, that there's an ongoing process where, you, where, where people are sharing back what they're taking away from. Now, can this happen in all disciplines? Like, I'm hearing you say this, and I'm like, okay, this can happen in social science, this can happen in English. I'm just thinking about the different disciplines that might come up, but, you know, do you see this happening in, I don't know, statistics, trigonometry? How, how does this, you know, this transformative dynamic still take place? Yeah. Because learning is not learning is not just a cognitive process, right? So um, we know that from learning theory that you know that the teacher cares about you. There's greater learning, right? So yes, it can happen. It doesn't matter the subject matter. It, what matters is, is how do students perceive how they're being taught in, in that learning process? And if they perceive the, the environment to be harsh, toxic, learning is 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 muted, right? So when students experience racial bias. Our students, um, just yesterday, this is just a, this is a, a, a point that's just on target. 
they're, they're, they have, um, at San Francisco State, they are kind of encouraging some of the faculty to have some of the courses online so that more students can take them. So I put my, one of my courses online, it's online and face-to-face. But I did it, you know, through the portal. I just had all the syllabus on there and activities. And then they looked at it, and I met with them yesterday. and said, Dr. Jim Wright, this is a great course, but there's no picture of you. I'm like, picture of me? Why do you need a picture of me for, man? You know, you know Lawson Foster, you know? And they said, no, it's not about you, Lawson Foster. It's just students need to have some kind of relationship with you. They need to see who you are. That way they see a picture of you on the, on the website or on the, the, the course um, platform, they begin to develop a kind of relationship. So integrating more kind of contact like that changes their perception of what the course is about. So all of these things have an impact. I really appreciate this conversation because I think we've been able to uplift some of these dynamics that impact black youth. Um, we mentioned social toxicity, we mentioned the idea of being open. Um, you've uh, started the conversation that I really appreciate just around the historical presence of black youth and activism and how um, you reject that idea of black youth being in crisis, but society is in crisis. Um, and I definitely appreciate as well um, the work that practitioners need to do with our young people and with our students to ensure that, you know, that we are in a good place before we expect them to be in a good place and before we actually begin to work with them in a valuable way. Um, I guess my last thing, and then I want to open it up to the audience, is um, what, what is something that you feel like um, parents can do to support this healing? Um, because I think a, a lot of what we want our, for our young people really starts at home. Um, and unfortunately, they get to classrooms or community-based organizations or you know your local you know uh, basketball coach, and they're already experiencing a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, so what can parents do? Grandparents, kids of kin, what can they do? To support? Yeah. No, it's a good question because you know most of my work is focused on young people. But one of the things I realized is that you know. Jason's been to a summer camp that I created called Camp of Healing, where we do a lot of this work with young people. And the young people come back from camp, they feel great, they feel great, they feel healed, they have tools, but then they go back into the house, right? Where their mama is doing something, or their pops is doing something, or they go back into a very toxic environment, or they go to a school that's very toxic, right? And so um, the, the, the need to really find the kind of support for, for parents I think is, is really critical. Um, one of the things that I've found is, is really important is that parents sometimes feel isolated, right? And that parents don't oftentimes have the kind of system to support that even their young people. So one thing that I've found is that by bringing parents together um, socially, right, just bringing parents together socially to build a, a sense of community can contribute to greater kind of engagement. So I think it's important to figure out how to bring parents together um, on a regular basis, not parent meetings, but you know, we've um, I've seen people uh, actually take uh, have their parent meeting, quote unquote, down at Kingston 11, right, with food, They're bringing parents together just to build a sense of community. Then once you're building that sense of community, then you know, then they can begin to talk about the challenges that they're having, right, and have peer to peer kind of shared learning. Well, my son. You know, he was doing this in school, and I called the principal, and this is what I did. You should try that. That there's a rich body of knowledge that parents hold that by sharing with each other, they can have a profound impact on, on their, on the, um, on the kind of changes that they want to see in their schools. Well, I want to thank you, um, and uh, Steph, they can give a round of applause. So thank you. So I want to take the next few minutes. To, um, give um, an opportunity for question and answer. Does anybody have any questions about um, what we spoke about or black human activism um, that came up? Any questions? Yes. I've got a lot of questions that you still don't want to um, So first you started off talking about the mechanism. So what is, can you describe some of the mechanisms that are approaching, uh, oppressing our youth, and then some of the outcomes um, that we see in our children from that oppression. Mm -hmm. So your question is, is, what are some of the 
the, the challenges that, 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 that oppress young people, and then how do we think about um, what are some of the outcomes as a result of that oppression? Yeah. Or what comes out of our kids? What comes out of our kids? Well, uh, I mean, I can name a, a number, but just one that comes to mind in a, in a project that I'll be working on is just um, we don't have enough resources or knowledge base around internalized oppression of children, right? So internalized racism um, is, a, is a form of oppression that embeds itself in the minds, spirits, bodies, and hearts of, of black babies, right? So we have some ideas about how that happens, but we don't really know how it happens. So for example, um, what are the, so I have questions about where do we find that in, the, in our society? We, we think it's in the media, we think it might come from books and magazines and media, but what role does social media play in internalized messages? Right, not for children, because children are not on Twitter, but, but for, for young people, right? So where, how is it that we can begin to think about how internalized racism gets propagated or, or promoted in our society? And then secondly, um, my view and lens on black families and communities is always around agency and resilience. So I assume that there's ways that black folks are resisting it. My mama raised me, and she would say things like, the black and very sweet juice. And I still remember that, right? Didn't know what she meant by that time. But she, what she was saying is, you know, we, as kids, we used to say, don't stay out in the sun too long, because you're going to get black, internalized racism. My mom used to say, the black and very the sweeter the juice, which is phrases, concepts, and terms that are embedded in my culture that says, actually, Darkness and pigmentation is a protection and a beautiful thing. So we're also interested in understanding how families and communities resist, respond in a resilient way to internalized oppression. Because if we understand that, then we can build programs, we can build strategies, we can build curriculum, and put them into the schools to use to support the healthy development for young people. So strategies for, for, for black young people to feel more valued, more, more humanized. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that I've found is that um, is providing uh, young people with two things. One is the ability for them to dream beyond the condition, right? So there's a way in which we begin to narrate and see police homicides and Black, you know, police being, uh, black young people being shot by the police that becomes a narrative, and that's all we see, and that's all we want to address. But I also think that we have to ask questions about well, what is it that we want to see, right? If you were to, so a question, for example, in a group, you can ask young people this in open. If you were to change the police department and those practices, what is one thing you would, would change? What would it look like? Might there be some examples, right? So we want to get them to think about what they want as opposed to only addressing the thing that happened, right? So that's about dreaming, right? And that, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a program where Brother Devon Bolton took some of his young people to South Africa, right? To take them out of the country to see examples of to things that actually are, are, are fertilizer for dreaming, right? To actually nurture that sense of dreaming and imagination. And then the second thing is voice, right? Giving young people the opportunity to say, speak um, um, about what it is that's on their minds and hearts. So there's a tendency for adults to kind of want to lecture. This is the way it was, this is the way it is, this is what you should do. But just creating an opportunity for young people to have a sense of voice, to be able to talk about things, I, I think is also critically important. How early do we start that? As, er as early as there's language. Children do it automatically, right? If you think about when you were a child, you used to, you know, pretend to be a firefighter, pretend to be something, right? And so, 
Um, the question is, when do we stop that? When we stop pretending? Because when we see pretending as something that's inauthentic, but pretending has powerful imaginative power, right? Profound imaginative power when we pretend. And that allows us to have a practice of seeing beyond the present. I really appreciate this. I was thinking um, about for the last 50 years plus I've been pissed off and angry and this idea about healing and taking care of yourself. A lot of people in my generation, I would think, have managed to survive because they have found a healing remedy. What do you think about this thought? Um, I'm trying to imagine an intergenerational connection with those of us who managed to survive, who have found some healing remedy. How would we, how could we share these lessons, these ointments with younger people? I'm thinking about the divide that exists on social media that my generation is not plugged into the social media channels that younger people use. <laughs> what could it look like? What would it take to get us to exchange our experiences and the lessons that we have? I find that there are opportunities for my generation to learn from young people and vice versa. No, I mean, I think that's a, an excellent question. And, you know, there are, there, you know, part of what we've experienced in our society is the sort of segregation of you know these sort of generational challenges, right? That that there aren't enough opportunities for that shared learning, right? So um, some of you may have heard about the Brotherhood of Elders, which is an intergenerational group of black men that come together to share learning and to have a positive impact. Um, and so the extent to which we can build in those kind of intentional learning communities. So my, so my insight about healing didn't come from me just sort of, oh, we need to heal. It came from lessons from folks in the civil rights generation saying, you know what, we put it all on the line for y'all, and it cost us. But had we done it, if we were to do it again, here's how we would do it. We would figure out, you know, so it was an intergenerational dialogue that allowed for that insight for this new generation to, uh, to redefine what activism looks like for them. I was fascinated when you were talking about um, the social justice sector. Not turning to the news, but uh, and that in order for people who are trying to work with young people to do the things that will renew themselves and keep themselves healthy, I think they have to believe that they are worthy that they are in doubt of value themselves. And at least in earlier generations, I think that's my generation. Uh, it took us a long time to realize that. So maybe the question is, how do you go about getting folks to understand in their own value? Yeah, I mean, I think value and, and, and um, dignity go, go hand in hand, right? And so harm to dignity, harm to value, it's still, a, it's still a healing process, right? And so getting people to really understand their value um, is, you know, understanding what harm did in the first place is significant for it. What made you feel devalued as a human being? What made you, what are the systems that created that? And then the healing, part of healing is knowing what harmed you, right? That's part of the healing process is knowing what harmed you. So understanding the process of internalized racism and poverty, all those things are significant and important. But the way to healing is daily practices. I call them a diet for justice, right? Everybody should be on a diet, particularly in this era with Trump. We need to be on a regular diet for justice. We all have a diet for weight loss. We all have a diet for physical health. What is our diet for justice? A diet for justice is what do we do small on a daily basis that actually contributes to a better, healthier society? What do you read? What do you blog about? What, do you, what kind of emails do you send? What do you watch on TV? What do you eat and put in your body? Daily micro-practices that ultimately 
small decisions about what we do that ultimately lend to a better, a better society. So that's a diet for justice. So I think those are the practices that ultimately can lead to some more agreement. I wonder those are the, um, the uncool, unlike concept of uh, me as a young black man, I use those terms a lot. So, and I use those terms because I'm not in a space where, I don't know how to explain it. I, I think it's my expectation when I use those, those terms. How can I abolish those expectations, like create new ones? Well, it's, it's, uh, so if we, if we start with, we have to understand what harm the limit is, right? We have to understand how masculinity, particularly black toxic, uh, uh, black masculinity, has assets and liabilities. And one of the things that black masculinity teaches us is that we don't have the right to feel. Right? We don't have that right that we have a way that we have to show up in society. We gotta be tough, we gotta be non-feeling and non-caring, right? And that expresses itself in a lot of different ways. It can express itself, which is, I'm a, my job as a father is to work and take care of this family. This is my dad, this is how my dad expresses it. I don't need any emotional support. I don't need to be emotionally there for my kids. I'm buying you shit. Right? I got a roof over your head. You got food. I'm t so, it sh so toxic masculinity shows up a different way. And so it's first to understand what caused it, right? Second is when you claim your right to feel, then you have to look for different ways to express yourself. Right? If you believe you have a right to feel, which that's, what only, that's the only thing that really makes us human, is our right to feel, then we have to establish a vocabulary that allows us to explore different emotions. And so, I'm all right, I'm cool, I'm good, is a shortcut because that's all we've been allowed to publicly sanction for black men to say and do. Black man, I was in a meeting the other day and his brother was like, man, I felt hurt when so-and-so did this to me. And here's why I felt hurt. Because, I mean, he was going through this emotional vocabulary I'd never seen from a 16-year-old. 16 talking about I was hurt and I was embarrassed. I felt shameful when this happened. I mean, he was going through an emotional attack I've never seen a black young man. So he had done some work in this program he was in, right? So the point is, is that we have to try on different language, right? And that sometimes that means we have to have courage and vulnerability at the same time, right? Yeah, great question, thanks.